In this video, I'm going to show you how to make professional, cinematic looking video with your iPhone 14 Pro or Pro Max. I'm going to go through the best settings, pro shots, film look, how to shoot and edit cinematic mode, camera movement and more. I'm also going to look at some accessories that can help you do a better job. If you're getting shaky shots, you might find that you need to hold your iPhone a little bit differently. So instinctively, when we are shooting photos or videos, we tend to hold our iPhone at the corners with our fingers like this, but that's pretty unstable. And even with the iPhone's inbuilt stabilization, our shots can come out less than perfect. So my tip is to hold one hand flat against the back of the phone and your other fingers still as they were before. And now you're gonna be much more in control of the shot. Another option is to get some kind of grip or rig or cage with handles, and that gives you a better grip for your iPhone. And also you can add other things like lenses, filters, lights, microphones, and that kind of stuff. So this one is by Freewell, and it comes in two main parts. First, there's a case, which has bayonet and magnetic mounting options for filters and lenses. As well, they do a grip with a Bluetooth button. I find the case to be really sturdy and pretty well made as well. Although being so strong, it does make it slightly harder to take on and off compared to the moment cases, for example and Freewell also makes a grip with a Bluetooth button. The grip has a spring-loaded clamp, so you clamp this around the phone and this gives you a more stable grip. But it's more than just a grip. There's a Bluetooth shutter button on the top of the handle. There's three quarter-inch threads on the top and three on the bottom so that you can attach a selfie stick or stick it on a tripod. There's also a cold shoe mount at the top. As well, this handle flips down and the base pivots. So now you have a handle. And a nice little thing is that the Bluetooth button can be removed from this end of the handle and it can be put here where it's kept in place magnetically. So you've got two options there. And we haven't even finished yet because look at this. Pull the handle and it extends. And the angle at the end can be adjusted as well if you want to film yourself. And I don't think I've ever tested a phone clamp that's as versatile as this. Another thing you can actually do is to use the grip as a desk stand for your iPhone. For example, if you're going to be editing video on your phone, your phone is now at a more comfortable angle. So this really is like a Swiss army knife of phone clamps. And the other thing is that it's really well designed. It doesn't feel cheap. So this really is a solid piece of kit and it kind of feels like it's made to last. This is just one example. There's plenty of alternatives. And if you want to have a look at the alternatives, just check out my video for accessories for iPhones. Now the thing is, it doesn't really matter what kit you buy or how many things you attach to your iPhone if you make poor shot choices. So let's talk about some basic principles to get better shots. When we're not sure what to film, we often try to film everything in one shot. So we shoot a pan shot because we can't really think of anything else. And then we shoot another pan shot or even worse, the aimless roving shot. Now, if you've got lots of those kind of shots, when you come to edit, your video is gonna come out kind of wishy-washy and unfocused. But if you are gonna use a pan shot, at least motivate the pan by following something, like tracking something, a person or a vehicle, follow their movement with the pan, and then you're motivating the shot and it's not so aimless. I've got a whole video lesson all about motivating camera movement for members on Patreon, if you wanna check that out. Otherwise, here's three shots that you can use instead of a pan shot. First, the tilt shot. Hold your iPhone as I just showed you. Press record and now make a tilt movement up or down. Nice and slow and as smooth as you can, but don't tilt with your wrists. Use your arms because using your wrists, you will have less control. With this shot, we can go from one subject to another subject, or we can tilt to show a different part of a subject. For example, the bottom of a building to the top, or someone's feet to the head. The tilt shot can be used in all kinds of different ways. Next, the push-in shot. Again, use the same grip, start recording, and move forward slowly and steadily, and try to keep the same speed through the shot. By getting closer to the subject with this shot, we can provide the audience with a clearer view, pulling them into the video. 
and focusing their attention on the subject. It also adds some visual interest compared to just an ordinary static shot. So here's a little trick. By reversing the shot and adding a zoom in effect during the editing, you can create a dolly zoom effect. Again, it just gives the shot more visual interest. And finally, let's try a parallax shot. Using the same camera grip, we will circle around the subject to create the parallax effect, in which the background appears to move faster than the foreground. In contrast to the previous flat images, this shot provides a more dynamic and three-dimensional view of the subject. Start recording and move slowly and steadily in a kind of arc around your subject. You don't need to go the full 360 degrees. The camera settings for your iPhone 14 Pro or Pro Max are going to vary depending on the type of video you're shooting, the desired appearance, as well as your personal shooting preferences. However, there may be certain settings which you're not clear about or you're just not familiar with them. So here are a few important ones to think about. Open settings, open camera, and then preserve settings. Here you can choose which settings you want the camera to return to when you open the app. Otherwise the phone will reset every time. The two important ones for me are camera mode, so it doesn't default back to photo mode each time, and macro control. Because personally I want control over the camera that I'm using, including the macro camera. Back in camera settings there's a macro control. With this off, the camera app will automatically switch to macro using the ultra wide camera when it detects that the camera is very close to an object. As I move the camera closer, you can see a jump as the camera switches. Personally, I prefer to decide when the macro camera activates. So back in settings, I switch macro control on. And now when the camera gets close to an object, a button appears which you can tap to switch on and off. If this is yellow, it will switch automatically to macro. If this is gray, then it's not going to change until you tap it. Now go back into formats. Here, I always use high efficiency so that I get smaller files. However, be aware this does mean that your photos will come out as HEIF instead of the much more user-friendly JPEG. Unfortunately, Apple doesn't allow you to choose HEVC video and JPEG photos at the same time. Go into record video settings and choose the combination you will use most frequently. This means you'll always get this as your default when you open the camera app. Choose 4K and 24 frames per second if you're working towards the movie look. Below that, you can show PAL format if you need to shoot in 25 frames per second for some reason. Because this might help you if you're filming in a country with 50 Hz electricity and you're getting some artificial light flickering. Otherwise, just leave it off. Below that, we have enhanced stabilization. If you switch this on, you will get more stable footage, but the image is going to be cropped in slightly. In other words, this is the digital stabilization switch. If you switch it off, you'll just get the optical stabilization, but with slightly higher quality images. Next is action mode lower light. So action mode is the extra digital stabilization feature that came with the iPhone 14 Pro and Pro Max. So toggle this on if you want this to be less effective in low light situations, but with better quality images. Below that is Dolby Vision. This is actually usually on by default and it can cause issues if you try to edit HDR video without actually understanding what you need to do. So toggle this off unless you know how to deal with Dolby Vision in post. Even if you don't want to export your final video in Dolby Vision, you can actually shoot in HDR and then do all your color grading before you then go ahead and export in regular SDR. So HDR is high dynamic range and SDR is standard dynamic range. So if you do this, you get 10-bit color, which has far greater color information than the normal 8-bit color. So it's really useful for color work in post. The reason that we don't usually export Dolby Vision is because it can cause viewing issues for people who don't have compatible monitors. So if you're uploading to social media, YouTube supports Dolby Vision, but not many other platforms do. Next one down is Auto FPS. So that stands for Auto Frames Per Second. Now some people get confused and mix this up with Variable Frame Rate, which is actually something else. So I go into more detail about all this technical stuff in my members lessons on Patreon. 
But all you need to know right now is that if you have this on, your iPhone starts choosing your frame rate for you depending on the light conditions. And as you may have guessed, I don't really like that, which is why I switched this off. Finally, at the bottom of this list is lock camera, which I have switched on. Again, this stops my iPhone doing things I don't want it to do. And in this case, that is automatically switching cameras in the middle of a take. So again, like with most auto settings, things changing during a shot usually look a bit messy, unless you're doing it deliberately. The iPhone 14 Pro can shoot regular 8-bit color, 10-bit color if you switch to Dolby Vision, and the highest quality, which is ProRes, or even 10-bit ProRes. Just bear in mind that ProRes files are very big, therefore you need plenty of storage and plenty of time to transfer those files from your iPhone to a computer for editing. Unless of course you're going to edit on your iPhone. If you want to shoot 10-bit color on your iPhone 14 Pro, then go into record video settings and switch on HDR. If you want to record 10-bit ProRes, switch on ProRes in formats as well as HDR. Then when you come to edit this HDR footage, you will need to set your editing software to the correct color space. So if speed is important to you and you're happy just making some small adjustments to the color of your video, then you can stick with 8-bit color. So personally, I shoot everything in 8-bit color in 4K resolution. And for me, shooting in 4K is more important than shooting in 10-bit Dolby Vision or in ProRes. But is there a real advantage to shooting in a high quality video format? How about using an app to shoot log footage with your iPhone? Well, you might want to consider these formats if you're thinking about achieving the film look, for example. These days, there are some really cool options for getting the film look but before you start thinking about shooting in log or 10-bit color there are some basic settings which can help you make your digital video look more like film the thing is that pretty much every movie shot in the last 100 years or so was shot and played back at 24 frames per second so if you want the film look the first thing to do is just to set your frame rate at 24 frames per second now, this is actually very simple to do with an iPhone. Just tap in the corner here until it says 24 frames per second. Another attribute connected to film is a slow shutter speed. Old movie cameras were generally set to shoot at 24 frames per second and 1 48th of a second shutter speed. This shutter speed stops your video looking too harsh by allowing motion to cause the image to blur. When we're taking photos, we usually want to avoid this kind of blur, but when we're shooting video, we actually usually want this blur. Without motion blur, our videos can look less smooth and less cinematic, especially if we're filming at the movie frame rate of 24 frames per second. When filming at higher frame rates, motion blur becomes less of an issue. So how do we add motion blur? The first and oldest method of adding motion blur is to set a slower shutter speed because fast shutter speeds remove motion blur. So how do we manually set the shutter speed of our iPhone camera? Unfortunately, Apple does not provide the ability to set shutter speed with an iPhone camera. And so we need to download an app which allows us to do this. Now the most famous is Filmic Pro, but it's now also actually the most expensive. But there are alternatives, even free ones. One that I like is called StarCam and is actually made by Duin to use with their gimbals, but you can use it perfectly well without a gimbal. I actually just love the simplicity of this app. You simply tap the setting bottom left, which is the shutter speed, and then switch it to manual. Swipe the slider to set shutter speed. And you know, the truth is that anything under one one hundredth is gonna look fine. So that's how to set shutter speed. But what do you do if you bring your shutter speed so that it's down below a hundredth of a second and now parts of the image are overexposed? Well, one option is to use what's known as an ND filter. So if you're outside and it's too bright, what do you do? That's right, you put some sunglasses on. And there are actually sunglasses for cameras called neutral density filters or ND filters for short. They come in different strengths measured in stops. In photography terms, one stop is equivalent to a doubling or halving of the amount of light. That's the difference between a shutter speed of 1 48th of a second or 1 96th of a second. Now, if you're going out filming in daylight, you'll probably find that ND4 isn't strong enough. And personally, I find that an ND32 
or an ND64 are required to bring your shutter down enough for smooth video. And actually, you can use ND filters to slow your shutter speed, even if you aren't manually controlling your shutter speed with an app. Because by reducing the light hitting the sensor, you actually force the iPhone to adjust shutter speed. And I promise you that you will get smoother, more filmic looking footage. The Freewell case I showed you earlier allows you to mount their ND filters. And this is one of the best systems I've tried. So the ND filters attach magnetically and that makes them pretty easy to mount. So this is their variable ND filter. Again, like all the other Freewell stuff, it's just feels solid and it's finished well. It just feels well made. I don't know about you, but I always enjoy using something if it kind of feels pro. So this gives you one to five stops of light reduction. And as well, it's true color, so it shouldn't change the color. So the good thing is that when you upgrade your phone, all you need to do is change the case and the filters are gonna work with it. That's as long as Freewell stays in business and keeps making iPhone cases. So you just turn the filter and it goes from one to five. So this is a fairly bright day, but as it's winter, it's probably not the brightest. If I set my shutter to 1 50th, this is what it looks like without the ND filter. Now, if I add the ND filter, you can see what a difference it makes. So for very bright conditions, you might want a stronger ND, but the point is that whatever ND filter you use, the shutter speed is gonna be slower than it is without it. So that's how to add motion blur using ND filters. But what if you don't want the hassle? You know, you gotta carry them around, you gotta get the right strength of ND filter, you gotta keep putting it on, taking it off, adjusting it. What other options are there? Well, there are other ways of fixing motion blur, by using post-production effects. There's a plugin by Real Smart which allows you to add motion blur to your videos in an editing system like Adobe Premiere Pro, for example. But it does cost over $100. However, there's a similar motion blur effect in the free editing app CapCut. So I've tried it and to my eyes, it works equally as well as the Real Smart plugin. A really great use of this effect is to add motion blur to your motion lapse videos and it can make them look a lot more smooth and cinematic. So one aspect of cinematic video where motion blur becomes more important is when it comes to camera movement. A lot of people talk about the inbuilt stabilization of the camera being a gimbal killer. That's because I suspect that they don't really understand what a gimbal is actually for. A gimbal doesn't just stabilize your camera. It allows you to capture really cool cinematic camera movements that you just can't get holding the phone in your hand. And believe me, I have tried. Simple camera movement is doable, just holding the iPhone in your hands. But if you wanna do anything more complicated, then I find that a gimbal is pretty much essential. For example, this low tracking shot was captured using a DJI Osmo Mobile 6. By using the extending handle, we can get this low angle with smooth camera movement at the same time. And this is a shot I captured using the Juin Smooth 5 with a monopod added to extend the handle. I was able to swoop around and then up in an arc. The Smooth 5 allows you to add extras like an anamorphic lens, ND filter, as well as a black mist filter. So you're gonna create much more engaging shots if you motivate your camera movement by following a subject. The subject can be a person, a vehicle, like a car or a train, or it could be someone riding a skateboard, basically anything moving. Another tool that improves the look of your video is having a shallow depth of field. And what this usually means is that only the subject is in focus, while the foreground and the background are out of focus. So normally, smartphones struggle with this aspect of cinematography and some people go to great lengths to try to add some extra shallow depth of field to their videos. But since the iPhone 13, we now have this cinematic mode, which is actually what I've been using for all these talking to camera shots throughout this video so far. And I'm just using the selfie camera in cinematic mode, 4K, and I think it looks pretty good. And cinematic mode is the iPhone's way of faking a regular pro camera that allows you to get a shallow depth of field. So it's not perfect, and I did notice some situations where it struggles, but considering it's a phone that you can carry around in your pocket, you know, I'm not complaining. If there's good light, I use the iPhone 14 Pro's front camera in 4K with cinematic mode. And this means I can see myself, so I know I've got the framing right. 
Let's look at some useful options we have when recording cinematic mode video. The F number in cinematic mode refers to the aperture setting you would normally have on a regular camera. Now, smartphones have fixed apertures, so changing this number doesn't change your actual aperture. Rather, it mimics the look that you get when you change the aperture on a regular camera. Now, put simply, the wider your aperture, the more blurry your background becomes. And just to confuse us, a wider aperture has a smaller number. So if you tap this F button, you bring up a slider and the slider takes your F number from 2.0 to 16, where 16 is the smallest aperture and therefore is going to be less blurry. 2.0 gives you the maximum blurry background. So this white dot represents the default F number. In other words, it's the F number Apple recommends that you use with this particular camera. For the main rear camera, this default is F2.8, while for the 3 times telly, as well as the selfie camera, the recommended F number is 4.5. You can actually change this later, so you don't need to worry too much about setting it wrong. In fact, you can edit the F number as well as programming focus changes, you know, like focus pulls. You can do this directly in your iPhone, or you can edit these cinematic mode clips in programs like iMovie or Final Cut Pro. Now, another great advantage of cinematic mode is that you can lock focus on a subject. The app is then going to try to keep focus on that subject, even if they move around. Just tap on the subject once to get the yellow box. And then if you short tap it again, it's going to lock on and track the subject. Now, this is actually different to the regular lock that I showed you before. Now, if you do a long press, you get the small yellow box and now it's not going to respond to any movements within the frame. Now as well, the app looks for faces and uses them to make focus changes. So I found that if you lock onto a face, you get the most reliable results. So this is another thing that you can do. While you're recording, you can switch focus from one object to another just by tapping the screen. So all you're actually doing is recording focus change points and you can go in and edit them later if you don't like them. One of the most common problems with vlogging with a regular camera is getting yourself in focus. You might not have a flip out screen or the screen might just be so small that you can't really see whether it's in focus exactly. So you can go out and you can shoot a load of stuff and then when you come back to look at it, you find that maybe it's not exactly in focus and maybe it's not usable. But with cinematic mode on the iPhone 14 Pro, and Pro Max, you can uh, fix the focus later. So of course the shallow depth of field doesn't quite match what you get from like a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, but it's just so much easier to vlog with the cinematic mode. And again, I'm just using the front facing selfie camera here, so I can see myself perfectly well. The framing's easy. I can also see actually that it's focusing on my face because I've got the big yellow box around my face. Now just be aware that the main camera does have a physical limit when it comes to focus. Thing is, it actually has to set focus in the normal way that a camera sets focus. And then it will actually apply this fake shallow depth of field on top of that. So when you come to edit, if something is physically out of focus, you're not going to actually be able to bring it into focus later. So this might sound complicated, but most of the time this isn't a problem. But I do think you'll understand better when I explain how to edit cinematic mode video. Open the video that you want to edit in the Photos app and tap Edit. You will now see the regular edit screen, but with this extra line of dots. And this line of dots represents the focus control. So let's call this the focus timeline. So where it's gray and you've got these gray dots and these bigger gray circles, these are the focus changes that are created automatically by the camera app. The yellow dots and the circles are those that you have created manually. And that will either be when you are recording the video by tapping the screen or when you're editing the video. So now you can play the video or you can slide the white bar to the point where you want to change focus. So if you want the focus to be somewhere else or on someone else, just tap that position on the screen. So a yellow square appears and it looks different depending on whether you're tapping on a subject or just some background detail. Regardless of that, you're going to get a yellow circle appearing on the focus timeline. When you play the video again, you will see an automated focus change, otherwise known as a focus pull or a rack focus. And you can delete these circles, which are basically keyframes, by tapping to select and then just tap the trash can. 
If you double tap on a subject, they will be tracked and focus is going to stay on them while they move around the frame. If you tap and hold on the screen, you can lock the focus at a certain distance. And now it's going to ignore any movement in the frame and it will keep a consistent focus. So you can just keep repeating this process throughout the clip, switching focus from one distance to another. So if you want to just have a quick look and see what your clip looks like without the manual changes, you can just tap this button here and this toggles the manual changes on and off. So like when we're shooting in cinematic mode, you can also change the F number when editing. You tap the F with the number at the top and this opens a slider which you can use to set the new F number. Now, whatever number you choose is going to be fixed for the whole clip because it actually only animates the focus changes. So you can't have aperture changes during a clip. When you're finished editing your clip, just tap done to save your changes. And if you want to undo any of these changes, just reopen the video, tap edit and then tap revert. iMovie is a free editing app that comes with every iPhone, every Apple computer and every iPad. It's very basic, but if you just want to cut together some clips quickly, it can be useful. And you can also use it to edit cinematic mode video. Open iMovie and start a project. Select one or more videos and then tap create movie. If the clip was shot in cinematic mode, you will see this symbol in the top left corner of the clip on the timeline. So when you tap on a clip to edit it, you're going to see that same symbol at the bottom. So tap that symbol and you now have the same controls that we saw earlier when editing in the Photos app. Here I'm using iMovie on my iPhone and it works exactly the same way as I described before. In fact, cinematic mode can be edited using three different programs. iMovie, as I just talked about, Final Cut Pro and Motion. And Motion is like Apple's version of After Effects. If you're using AirDrop, which I do, if you simply share your cinematic mode video to another device, your iPhone will first render the cinematic mode effect. This will mean the blurry background effect is now baked in and you won't be able to edit, focus changes or the F number. So this is how you share your cinematic mode videos via AirDrop so that they can still be edited. Select all your cinematic mode clips, tap the share button. Now tap options and toggle on all photos data. This means it won't render out the blurry background before sending. Instead, it will keep all the information for use in iMovie, Final Cut Pro or Motion. On your computer, you will now get a folder containing the video clips. In the folder, locate the MOV file that does not begin with IMG underscore E. Then import it into your editing program. To import your cinematic mode files into a project, choose File, Import Media, then locate the file or files which do not have the E in the name of the file, as I explained in the previous section. You can also right click here and import that way. So I'm just going to choose this one file. Now, when I drop this clip onto the timeline and select it, I get this cinematic option on the right with the other clip settings. And if I click to fill that check in, I now get the cinematic mode controls. So we get this slider, which we can use to change the F number. As I use the front camera, it's currently set to the default F 4.5. But if I slide this to the left and right, you can see the amount of background blur changing. Above the slider, you'll find this icon, which is the cinematic mode icon. And you can click this to toggle cinematic mode on and off. And when it's on, you will see this yellow box around whatever object was focused on when filming. In this case, it's my face. And this cinematic mode button is also below the preview window. To open the cinematic editor on the timeline, right click the clip and select show cinematic editor from the list. We now get that row of grey dots that we saw previously. And if you've made any manual focus changes when recording, you're going to see those here as yellow dots. So I didn't actually do that when I was recording this clip. So I'll just click on the background here to make a manual focus change. The focus switches to the background and you can see the yellow dots appear, with the big yellow dot being the point at which the focus changes. So this big yellow dot is basically a keyframe. To delete a keyframe, click on it and then just choose delete. If I move the timeline along, I can click on my face to set another focus change point. And now you can see that I have two big yellow dots. And if I play the video, you will now see the focus change from my face to the background and then back again. And it changes nice and smoothly like a focus pull should. 
Apart from setting a focus change, you can also lock focus onto a subject. So at the moment, the yellow frame is around my face, which means cinematic mode is focusing on it. If I click on my face again, I get a full square and a message which says AF autofocus tracking lock. So the clip is now going to use the tracking information that it recorded when it recorded the video to keep focus on me. Well, that is until another manual focus change tells it to do something else. So this is going to be useful if you have more than one subject in the frame and the clip switches automatically to another subject. Because if you'd rather that the focus stayed on one subject, use the tracking lock to tell a clip which subject to stay focused on. So when you move your mouse over the image in the preview window, you might see some light gray squares appear. And these are placed around suggested objects to focus on. In this case, there are two squares. And at the moment, my face is out of focus. But if I click anywhere within either of these gray squares, it will add a focus change, moving from the background to my face. And if I click again, it will start tracking. But what if I want to focus on a point in the background that happens to be within this big gray square. Because if I click on the background, it will just focus on me and not the background. So I need to click outside of the gray square and now it will focus on the background. So this small yellow square with the target lines means that the focus is gonna be locked at a certain distance. And again, until another big yellow keyframe tells it to do something else. There are some downsides to cinematic mode. As I said, it can have a slightly fake look, especially if you do set the background to be very blurry. If you go for something a bit more subtle, it can look more convincing. And I also found that sometimes the app struggles to work out what is what. For example, when I was filming in the snow, you can see that it doesn't quite map out the edges correctly. And another time I was filming for a YouTube tutorial, and it actually blurred out the screen of my phone as if it was the background. So that wasn't really usable. And another problem that I haven't actually seen anyone else mention is that I found that your iPhone needs to process the footage before sharing it. So in my workflow, I shoot my two camera stuff and then I send it from my phone to my laptop to be edited. Before editing in normal software, you need to actually render this focus effect and this actually takes time, especially if you shoot video in 4K. It's not a deal breaker, but it does mean there's some extra waiting time. That said, if you're editing in Final Cut Pro or iMovie, you can bring it straight in and the effect will be rendered when you export from Final Cut Pro instead. Another downside is that you have less camera options. There's no ultra wide or two times telly in cinematic mode. And as well, you can't switch between cameras when recording as you can in regular video mode. These are what's known as anamorphic lenses. And they were first used in cinema in the middle of the last century as a way to make movies look different from TV. You know, they needed a reason to get people out of their living rooms and to come to a movie theater. In short, they decided to make movies wider. And to do that, they used a lens which squashes the image in at the sides and which would then be stretched out again by a conversion lens mounted on the projector. It was kind of the 1950s version of IMAX 3D. But later on, anamorphic lenses became cool. Filmmakers fell in love with the character the lenses added to their movies. And that's really what you have to remember when you use one of these lenses. You're not just getting a wider view, you're adding character. For example, the distinctive long straight lens flares. The lenses also add some chromatic aberrations and perhaps a little bit of softness. So there's two types of anamorphic conversion lenses available for smartphones. The more common 1.33 times, which is like Cinemascope, and the ultra Panavision style 1.55 times anamorphic. 1.33 times gives a 2.39 to 1 aspect ratio and has been used in cinema far more than the 1.55 times, which gives a 2.76 to 1 aspect ratio. In fact, Ultra Panavision 70mm film was briefly used in the 1950s and 60s before falling out of use, until Quentin Tarantino used it for his movie The Hateful Eight. So this is one by Freewell. It's called Cinematic Blue 1.55 times which means it creates these blue light flares and it has a very long aspect ratio. The lens comes in a pouch and it's 
you know, well built, just like everything else seems to be by free will. And you also get a series of filters for the lens. There's ND8, ND16, ND32, ND64, and there's also a basic UV filter. Oh, and the tiniest lens cloth that you've ever seen. So which one should we use? And can we mix these ratios? Well, the 1.55 times is very wide, and for that reason, it's rarely used in cinema. And anybody watching your video is gonna get these big, wide black bars at the top and the bottom. In the right place, it can look really cool. As well, it's kind of fun playing at being Quentin Tarantino, isn't it? On the other hand, the 1.33 times is more easy to use. And I've seen documentaries where they do actually mix the 2.39 to 1 aspect ratio with regular 16 by 9 footage. So it's got its own style. It's a very much a creative choice. So just have fun with it because really there isn't any rules in movie making. Uh, well, at least my only rule is that if it looks good, then it is good. One question I've been asked is, does cinematic mode work with an anamorphic lens? So let's give it a try. I did a quick test with the iPhone 14 Pro and the Freewell 1.55 times and switched to cinematic mode on the main camera. So I set it to the maximum f 2.0, just so that you can really see the effect exaggerated. And you can see that it does detect me as I walk into shot. So that's all still working fine. And in general, it seems to work just as well as it does without the lens. You can see that when I place my hands on my head, cinematic mode now struggles. It can't tell that this area inside my arms is actually the background. And it just sees me and my arms as one object. And so then it just creates a mask around everything and blurs everything outside it. But it leaves that little sort of triangle area unblurred but that can actually happen whether you have a lens mounted or not and it doesn't always happen so i tried it without the lens and then i stood a little bit nearer to the camera and it was able to actually detect the background correctly but overall it does seem that adding an anamorphic lens isn't going to cause problems for the cinematic mode another way to add character to your iphone videos is to use a diffusion filter what this does is scatter the light before it hits the sensor and they're used by photographers and cinematographers all the time. And you get this kind of glow around light sources and it stops the shadows being crushed to black. And they're often flattering for your subject as well because iPhone video or any smartphone video can often look harsh and over sharpened and adding a diffusion filter helps to reduce that sharpness a bit. Essentially, diffusion filters just make your images look a little bit more dreamy. So there's loads of companies that make these. A famous one is Tiffin, who make a range of them, including them probably the most well-known, which is the Black Pro Mist. Moment do a series, and they're called Cine Bloom. And this one is by Freewell, and it works with the case that I showed you earlier. Although, unfortunately, you can't actually mount it to the anamorphic lens. So I found that the mist effect from the Freewell is pretty subtle, which you might actually prefer. And the thing about the Tiffin filters and the Cinebloom filters is that they come in different strengths. The Tiffin that I showed you here is actually one half strength, while this Freewell is only a quarter strength. So that's not as strong. You won't get as much of a bloom effect around lights. And as far as I can see, this is the only strength available for the Freewell filter. If you do want to learn more about the film look, I've actually written a book about this and it's available to download for members on Patreon. It's quite a quick book where I explain all the characteristics that make up the look of film that you can add to your digital videos if you want to give them that look. So it's just $5 to get started and it's a nine day course for beginners to advanced. I've also got other books, other video lessons on the Discord server. You can chat to other members and me. And if you have any specific questions, you can get answers to those. So that's it for this video. And uh, I'll see you in the next video that I see you in.